Hi everyone, I'm David Fisher, and this is Presidential Chronicles. The series of books and videos on American history is seen through the lives of the presidents of the United States. This episode is from the life of William McKinley, and the focus is teenage warrior. The McKinleys arrived in North America in the early 18th century. David McKinley coming over from Europe, landing in York, Pennsylvania. It was a different David McKinley who fought in the revolution as a private with the Continental Army. He eventually moved from Pennsylvania to Ohio, and we fast forward a couple of generations, and that's where we find William McKinley Sr. This is Niles, Ohio, a tiny hamlet, about 300 folks. The main business in town, that's where William McKinley Sr. worked was the foundry. They produced pig iron. Here he met his bride, Nancy Allison. They got married in 1829, had nine children, number seven, named after the father, William McKinley Jr., born January 29, 1843. The McKinleys lived in a home that sat atop the neighborhood grocery store, which covered most of the first floor, and they were primarily in the second floor. They also had a family farm. The kids worked in the farm along with the mother. The father, he was in the, in the town furnace, working through that main industry at the foundry. Education, very important to the McKinleys, and practical education, and a lot of it originally was in the home. His mother and his sister, Anne, were primarily responsible for teaching him, again, the practical uh, tools and how to move forward in life, but also a very firm founding on morality, right and wrong, patriotic allegiance to the country, and abolition. Nancy McKinley, uh, McKinley's mother said at the time, the McKinleys were very strong abolitionists, and William early imbibed very radical views regarding the enslavement of the colored race. This was far before abolitionism became more popular and pronounced in the North. McKinley described as rather bookish, but he also had some fun. He liked to play marbles, was very fond of his bow and arrow, liked to fish and swim in the Little Beaver Creek. But education drove really the next step in the McKinley family. They decided to move about 20 miles away to Poland, Ohio to get that better education. McKinley at the age of nine enrolled at the Poland Seminary. And he thrived academically, particularly his oratory skills, which really stood out even at a young age. By the time he was 17, it was time to go to college. Allegheny College in Menville, Pennsylvania was the destination, just about 75 miles away. But he stayed there less than a year. McKinley had sort of an extended illness. And when he came home, frankly, the family was struggling for income. So he decided to abandon college, get a job. He got a job as a teacher. He decided to walk the three miles each way to and from school each day to save on the rent. So times were tough, but still the family was together and that was actually the most important thing for the McKinleys. William McKinley was politically aware at a very early age. His father had been a Whig and had now transitioned to the Republican Party as the Whigs sort of disintegrated in the early 1850s. The Republicans maintaining many of those tenets of the Whig Party, but also adding a new one no more expansion of slavery, and not a surprise for the, surprise for the abolitionist leading McKinleys that William Sr. and Jr. would gravitate to the Republican Party. First election he really kind of got focused on was 1856, the first time the Republicans ran a candidate for the presidency. It was still primarily a northern sectional party only. This was not a national activity yet. The Democrats were still really the national party, and so their candidate, John Fremont, did not win that election. It went to James Buchanan. But fast forward four more years, it was the Democrats that had split primarily on the topic of slavery that opened the door for the Republicans and their nominee, Abraham Lincoln, to win the presidency. Right after that, the southern states, seven of them, in fact, just decided to secede from the Union. Lincoln becomes president, inaugurated March 4, 1861. Fort Sumter falls the following month. The Civil War is underway, and Lincoln calls for volunteers, 75,000 volunteers to fill out the army and suppress this rebellion. So William McKinley is now 18 years old in 1861, and he's initially not sure, is he going to go join the army or not? But he and his friends saw everyone else seem to be volunteering, and basically decided he should go as well. McKinley told his cousin, William Osborne, that it seems to me the country needs every man who can go, and I can. So he and Osborne signed up, three-year enlistments, but Osborne actually failed his physical, so he had to go back home. McKinley passed his, he was sworn into the Army June 11, 1861. He's part of the Ohio 23rd Volunteer Regiment. A really interesting group here. Now, almost entirely made up of citizen soldiers. These were volunteers, never had fought in the Army before, but they were led by a West Pointer, a colonel by the name of William Rosecrans, who was the leader of this thousand-man regiment. But interesting in the leadership level, you had Stanley Matthews as the lieutenant colonel. Matthews would eventually become a senator and a Supreme Court 
court justice. And the major, that was Rutherford Hayes. Rutherford Hayes would go on to become president of the United States, the Ohio 23rd, the only regiment in U.S. Army history to have two presidents in it at the same time. Now, the 23rd was first involved in a lot of training because, again, these were citizen soldiers. They had to get ready for battle. So it was really September by the time they were ready to engage the enemy. And their first assignment was to confront Confederate Colonel John Floyd. Floyd had brought Confederates across the Gauley River near the town of Carnifax Ferry. This is in northwest Virginia. And they were executing raids in this territory, and the 23rd was on point to kick them out. Well, this is the eve of the first battle for William McKinley. He wrote a letter putting his thoughts on paper. He wrote, the tomorrow morning sun will undoubtedly find me on a march. It may be I will never see the light of another day. In this emergency, let my parents, brothers and sisters and friends have their anxiety removed by the thought that I am in the discharge of my duty, that I'm doing nothing but that which my revolutionary fathers before me have done. And also let them be consoled with the solacing thought that if we never meet again on earth, we will meet around God's throne in heaven. The heat of the battle was a tough time for McKinley and his mates. They were temporarily trapped in a low river, kind of crouching in the mud to avoid enemy fire, eventually pushed back, got to a point of safety. It was a back and forth battle, but eventually the Union artillery was too much for the Confederates. A big victory for the Union and the Ohio 23rd as the Confederates left. They actually retreated back across the Gauley River. The Union loyalists in the area were now safe. It was a nice victory, the first battle for the 23rd, but it was also particularly to gain confidence. These were folks who were fighting in battle for the first time together. The men gaining confidence in their leaders and the leaders gaining confidence in the men. Rutherford Hayes would later say about William McKinley, and Hayes would become very much of a mentor to McKinley during the course of their uh, service in the Ohio 23rd. Uh, but Hayes said young as he was, McKinley was a man of rare capacity. When battles were fought or service was to be performed in warlike things, he always took his place. The night was never too dark. The weather was never too cold. There was no sleet or storm or hail or snow or rain that was in the way of his prompt and efficient performance of every duty. In fact, after the victory at Carnifax Ferry, uh, McKinley was promoted, basically mostly because of Hayes. He was promoted to the rank of sergeant, and he was placed in the quartermaster corps. That's where actually uh, Hayes thought he could do the most good. They didn't have any more battles in 1861, went into winter quarters. 1862 rolls around and things are not going that well for the Union Army. George McClellan is the commander-in-chief. He finally gets his army trying to take Richmond, the capital of the Confederacy. It is a dismal failure. President Lincoln calls up for more volunteers and Confederate General Robert E. Lee, who took over for the Confederates after those battles near Richmond, thought he should go on the offensive. And he actually decided to take his core or army into the north to cross the Potomac River. And he actually picked Frederick, Maryland, is the place to initially set his ground. Well, the Lincoln, uh, President Lincoln decided to send uh, the re reinforcements that were basically guarding Washington, D.C. to co confront Lee before he could potentially come and attack the Capitol. But also other parts of the Union Army were sent as well, including the Ohio 23rd, was sent to mass to both defend the Capitol, but also to attack Lee and try to take the battle to him. Well, Rutherford Hayes is now the colonel of the 23rd. Uh, William McKinley is the sergeant in the quartermaster corps, and they're getting ready for the big fight, the big fight at South Mountain. This is where Lee had decided to make his defensive stand, where he was actually massing a few miles away at Antietam Creek in Sharpsburg, Maryland. But first, the Union Army was going to have to get through one of the gaps in South Mountain. And the Ohio 23rd was on point to get through what was called Fox Gap. They made a little bit of a push initially, then pushed back. This was a bloody war. A lot were uh, a lot of casualties, in fact, were taken by the Ohio 23rd more than any other unit that day. They lost 32 killed, 130 wounded, including Colonel Hayes, who nearly bled out at South Mountain. But this was merely a prelude to the fight three days later at Antietam Creek. When this horrific fight took place, which eventually became the bloodiest single day of the entire Civil War, a group of the 23rd were bogged down. And word got back to uh, the folks in, in the rear, including McKinley, part of the Quartermaster Corps, uh, a couple of miles away, that they were out of, they had no provisions, they hadn't eaten since the night before, they were stuck, and McKinley felt he had a duty to actually go relieve them, to bring them supplies, food, coffee, water, things that could actually help them in the fight. Well, he looked around for volunteers to go with him. 
he found only one man who volunteered. His name was John Harvey. They loaded up their supplies into their wagon. They started going along, and at every checkpoint, they were told, turn back. It's not safe. You're not going to get this wagon through. McKinley said, no, I've got to go relieve these men. I've got to bring them provisions. Even when a cannonball struck the back of their wagon and sort of blew that part apart, they continued going and eventually made it to the rousing cheers of the men of the 23rd, who finally were able to partake of some food, get some coffee that was served by McKinley, continue that fight at Antietam. McKinley was celebrated in this, in this victory for the, for the Union. Again, extremely bloody, but it was a victory. And McKinley was noted by Rutherford Hayes, who was off recuperating from his injury on his service. In fact, he decided to push for McKinley to actually move into the officer corps. And in fact, that promotion came through. And just now, a teenager still, William McKinley, is a second lieutenant. He later told Hayes that he called it the proudest and happiest moment of my life. Antietam changed the war in a couple of ways. Uh, number one, again, big victory for the Union. Robert E. Lee's men did escape back across the Potomac to fight another day, but it also was the catalyst for Abraham Lincoln to publish his draft Emancipation Proclamation, deciding to free slaves in any part of the Union, state or territory, that was still in rebellion against the Union as of 100 days hence, uh, January 1st of 1863. Now, some in the North actually balked at this, kind of changed the purpose of the war from preserving the Union to freeing the slaves. Some were more for the latter and not as much for the former as a reason to go to war, but not McKinley. McKinley. McKinley, abolitionist background, he was happy to fight for both, preserve the Union and free the slaves. 1863, pretty quiet actually for the Ohio 23rd, really had only one major fight. This was again some Confederate raiders, this time under the command of General John Morgan in the area of Gallipolis, Ohio. They had been creating raids throughout the entire area. The 23rd came in and actually it was a rout, big victory, and it was really the only major battle for the 23rd in the entire year. But 1864 would be different. The last major push uh, in the war, of course, would end in 65, but the lead up to that occurred when Ulysses Grant took over the Union Army in 1864. That foretold a very aggressive push against the Confederates, and the Ohio 23rd would be a part of this. One of their most difficult was going to be a raid on the railhead in Dublin, Virginia. This was 100 miles or so into Confederate territory. It was tough to get to, and it was going to be a tough fight against an entrenched enemy, the Ohio 23rd, again, on point. They had to cross a, a wide open expanse into the teeth of the enemy fire, ended up with hand-to-hand -hand combat. Eventually, they pushed the enemy back, eventually sent them running for their lives, and they were able to not only destroy their train station, but also the telegraph office, the nearby military stores, and even the 400-foot New River Bridge, which was also critical to transportation for the Confederates. This was now a dead end for the Virginia and Tennessee Railroad and a major success for the Ohio 23rd. But they weren't done. The Perhaps the toughest part of this fight was getting back home. They still had that 100 miles to get through, and there were Confederates sort of behind every tree taking shots at them, and they were out of provisions. After a few days in, there was rain and mud that really slowed them down. They were tr trying to live off the land, fight off starvation. McKinley and the Quartermaster Corps really had his work cut out for them, and they were finally relieved nine days of this by the time they got to the safety behind their own lines. Focal point then in 1864, the balance was in the Shenandoah Valley. Now, this had always been in the hands of the Confederates. It had been actually sort of their breadbasket. They made, uh, they actually grew a lot of the foodstuffs that, uh, that fed the Confederacy during the war, and Ulysses Grant wanted that ended. He wanted the Confederates gone from the Shenandoah Valley, the Ohio 23rd, very much part of this fight. There were fights along the way. Places like Martinsburg, Har Harper's Ferry, Snickers Ferry, Keyes Ferry, there were wins, all wins, but no knock knockout blow. The next fight actually almost had a knockout blow for William McKinley. This was the fight at Winchester, which was a tough one for the Union Army. In fact, at one point, uh, Colonel Hayes, who had recuperated from his injury, now back in charge, had actually ordered a retreat. But he realized that one of his colonels, William Brown and his men, were cut off by the Confederate line, and there was no way initially to get word to them to retreat. And, and Hayes knew he had to get word. So what did he do? He picked his ever-reliable William McKinley and said, we need to get word. 
order that retreat and bring Colonel Brown back with us. Well, McKinley didn't hesitate. He got on his horse, galloped away, and in fact, many thought he would never make it. Musket fire, artillery, smoke is everywhere. At one point, they lost sight of McKinley. They thought he had gone down, but sure enough, that smoke cleared. He got through the Confederate line, delivered that message, and when he came back with Brown and his men, Colonel Hayes uh, met him, congratulated him, and said, frankly, I never expected to see you in, in life again. He sure enough did, and that relationship, of course, would continue for a long, long time. The final fight in the Shenandoah Valley took place at Cedar Creek. It started out as almost a rout against the Union Army, the Confederates breaking through the camp at early morning light, the uh, Union soldiers sort of running for their lives, eventually forming a line quite a bit away. Major General Phil Sheridan, who had taken over in charge of the fight in the Shenandoah Valley, was, was about 12 miles away when this one began. He was called. He raced uh, to the fight itself, and he immediately went on the attack, a counterattack. And sure enough, the Confederate soldiers were spent. The Union Army brushed back through them. They recaptured all the land they had lost that day, and the fighting in the Shenandoah Valley was essentially over. This was pretty much the end of the fighting for the Ohio 23rd. Uh, William McKinley had one more recognition of his honor, one final promotion to the rank of Brevet Major. When they got into 1865, it was mainly sit back and watch as Robert E. Lee eventually surrendered to Ulysses Grant. The Civil War was coming to an end. They all then mourned the loss of President Lincoln, who was assassinated. This is all now in April of 1865. But again, it was time to bring that, that part of his life to closure as the Civil War did come to an end. One lasting impression of the Civil War for William McKinley, when he was president-elect, coming forward a couple of decades now, he was asked, sir, what should we call you? And William McKinley basically said, call me major. I earned that. I'm not so sure of the rest. And throughout most of his life, he was known as Major McKinley. Time to muster out of the Army, June 26, 1865, return home to Ohio. He's still only 22 years old. What's next? That's the story for another day. That is William McKinley and Teenage Warrior from the life of William McKinley. For more Presidential Chronicles, check out my books on Amazon.com. And don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Until next time, I'm David Fisher. This is Presidential Chronicles.